Hello and welcome. He's more than a tailor as he dresses the rich and famous with his distinctive style. Setting up shop in Savile Row, the heart of London's upmarket tailoring, he made sure men's fashion would never be the same again. This week on One on One, meet stylish designer and bespoke couturier Oswald Boateng. It was a purple mohair suit from his mother that got the young Oswald thinking about a career as a clothing designer, and he credits her for his sartorial elegance. His drive to succeed, despite being knocked down a number of times, finally had him located in Savile Row by the age of just 28, making him the youngest and the first black tailor with that prestigious address. Boateng's style, embracing bold colors and narrow cuts, is favored by the rich and famous who seek him out making his suits a sought-after item for Hollywood stars on Oscar night. He made men's fashion an essential element of London Fashion Week before crossing the Channel to Paris, where French fashion house Givenchy made him creative director of their menswear range. Boateng's artistic talent is also featured in his creative interests, which extend to directing film and animation features. In 2006, his work in the fashion industry was rewarded with one of the highest British civilian honors, an OBE. His sights are now set on making the Boateng brand global, opening shops in the USA, Asia, and the Middle East. Oswald, it's great to talk with you. Mm -hmm. You know, you describe yourself as a bespoke couturier, and I know that's supposed to define more what you are, so explain that to me first. Well, you, let's look at the world of traditional bespoke tailoring. That's about handmade suits or suits made for individuals. And then couture kind of represents design at a very high level one-off pieces of beautiful design. And so for me, it's kind of bespoke couture was kind of like a fusion of both. Because when I did um, my first catwalk show in, in, in Paris as a tailor, uh, a really famous journalist there called Andre Leontelli pulled me aside and said, you know, you're a couturier for men. And I said, no, 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 I'm a bespoke tailor. He said, no, you're a couturier because there's too much design in what you do. And I said to myself, well, then that's where I realized I had a problem in defining what I do. Because I work in a very traditional way, bespoke tone, but yet I'm doing, I'm working also like a fashion designer. So I realized I had to redefine what it was I, 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 what I was. Well, I know you're sort of credited with, with bringing bespoke tailoring and the, the whole Savile Row concept to a new generation. Mm -hmm. And your clients include, you know, anyone from actors like Will Smith, Lawrence Fishburne, to rock legends like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mick Jagger and mm -hmm. so on. Um, and I know you, and even James Bond, you mm -hmm. know, James Bond says. And interestingly, you, you do talk about yourself more, though, as a tailor than a designer. And I wonder why. Well, my roots are in tailoring, you see. And, and the reason, I think the big point of that is, is that's why I came up with this concept of bespoke couture is how do I define what I do? You know, I always make suits for individuals and I design collections. So couturiers make one-off pieces and also design collections and they don't have to, they're not struggling with definition. So really all the tailors on Savaro are really couturiers. They just haven't defined themselves as so. And that's why I realized that I had to create this concept of the both together. So when anyone asks me what I do, I say, well, I'm a tailor, but I design collections, and I define that as a bespoke couturier. How did you break uh, through that stuffy barrier of Savile Row? Traditionally, I mean, it's a world-renowned, uh, obviously, name, but how did you break through and, and make, make a name for yourself on that sort of traditional row? Well, that's always, that's, it's, it's an interesting story, I think. How I got to Savile Row as well, I was introduced to it by a friend of mine. I met a very famous tailor called Tommy Nutter, and he was the one who kind of defined for me the importance of Savile Row. And I realized at that point that Savile Row was just a street which was dying out. And I actually knew that my approach to tailoring, which was more in a fashion designer's context, was a huge value to Savile Row. And at that point, I decided that I wanted to open the store. The way the other tailors responded to me was they weren't quite sure what that meant, me opening a shop. You know, I was very well known amongst them. I was quite known in the media at that point. I had a very strong following. And there was an interest that I could bring something new, because that's what I always promoted in the media. But they were scared what impact that would have on them. But the great thing is, is when I opened shop, everyone's sales went up 25%, so I was good for business. 
So in the end of it, it was, it was all good news. I love your description, you know, of, of how you've uh, brought the gentrification of colour. Absolutely. You know, and I Absolutely. think that, that's kind of a, a bit... Why is it men seem to be traditionally so scared of wearing colour? It's, you know, greys and blacks. I mean, I'm in grey, you know. Mm. Uh, British Prime Minister John Major was accused of being a grey person, you know. And uh, Grey and black seem to be the colours, especially in Britain. And yet you've brought colour into it all. Well, well, the thing here is this, again, you know, uh, I feel that anyone can wear any colour, providing they balance it the right way. Right now, I'm wearing this fabric right now with all this interesting check, which is quite interesting colors, blue, a bit of purple, and navy, navy background. But yeah, I'm wearing a white shirt. So once you bring a white shirt to a color, you create a certain formality. And because there's a sort of, the way I cut has a certain structure to it, and it follows such a traditional line, it makes, it makes the color that you see look more formal, so you're less judgmental of the color. You kind of accept the color in a different way because the, the lines are telling you formality. And so that's why, you know, when it's defined of me as gentrifying color, that's how I've done it. I want to take you back through your roots because you were born in London, in North London, and grew up to Ghanaian immigrants in, in London. And, I mean, obviously the, the family influence was still that, that flavor of Africa. Mm. And I wonder, as a young man, what you remember about combining that unique flavor of Africa with what is quite a unique flavor of London. Well, this is interesting. When I first started designing, I never used to reference Africa. And then I went to Ghana for the first time in 1990. And I will never forget this because I woke up in the morning, I was in my hotel, looked out the window, there was a market. And if you know, in Ghana, all the markets were run by women. And all these women were wearing these beautiful colored fabrics. But what was more interesting is the combination of the colors. And the combination of the colors were the, very much the way I used color in my own work. And that completely blew me away. That was... And you're only about 22 at the time. Yeah, I, mean, I was a baby at that point. I'm probably even <laughs> younger. Probably like, I think I was 20 or 21. So I was completely blown away by um, the use of color and, and how that subconsciously had been influenced on me from my cultural roots. Because to that point, I'd never put the two together. It, for me, it was just purely instinctive. You know, and there was never really a reference because, you know, I was using navy suits with bright colored shirts and interesting ties in a very formal way. But the color combinations were very unique. And I had, no one had never seen that sort of combination until when I looked at these fabrics. I went, the color combinations are the same. The use of them is very different, but the color combinations are the same. Tell me about the early family life, though. I mean, uh, London was an interesting time. There, was, there were issues of race, absolutely, racial prejudice. Absolutely. Did, uh, what, was, what sort of uh, early life did you have? Did you feel that kind of pressure being a young black kid in North London? Well, yes, I did. I mean, you know, growing up in London uh, during those days, which was uh, kind of, you know, early to mid and late 70s, were, you know, it was hard. You know, I remember having to go to school and uh, there needs to be like these uh, teddy boys living at the corner with the big old station dogs. So going to school was a problem every morning. You know, dogs barking and being spat out and things like that. So yeah, you know, I experienced uh, a lot of those things. Interesting thing is, is my father had a huge influence on me, which was, you know, he said, uh, you know, he had a certain set of rules of life, you know. A problem's only a problem if you make it a problem, you know. He was a headmaster, yeah, so he's exactly. like, discipline so he's a, and strict. Yeah, so, he, so the thing is, he always sent me these rules. So I never let my color be the issue of a problem. So it would have been easy for me to say, oh, they're doing it because I'm a black kid. I just said, well, they just don't like me. So I, and, and that's kind of how I led my life. And then eventually what happened was, is, um, those sort of issues stopped happening. You know, and it's a very interesting thing when you, don't allow someone to use your colors at all to attack you. Now they've got to attack you for something else. Suddenly it, it, it changes for you. Interestingly enough, you loved school uniform, which is not... Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Formality from the get-go. You know, I was, I was, it was my, my school uniform when I was a very... Because I started school at three years old. And um, we had this great uniform. And, you know, I just loved the blazer and the, the cap and the... You know the V-neck jumper with the tie and the shirt, and you know socks and shoes. So I, I've always liked style and the combination of things. So it's interesting. Years later, where I thought I'd never do clothing or be in fashion, that same attitude is what I use now today. The combination of V-neck and the tie. Yeah.
But you did have an early injection of like, you know, the, the couture flavor with the purple mohair suit. You're only five. Tell me about that one. That's, that's really good because um, I remember going to see my father and um, many years later, and I don't know, maybe I was about 25 at this point, and he said, oh, I've got some pictures of you. And I looked at this picture and I was five years old. And I said, that's a purple mohair suit. <laughs> and it's double breasted and it's like, and there's a particular term for it, DB1, where you just saw, you see two buttons at the front, but you call it a DB1. And it's, I'm famous for this cut. And there I am at five years old, wearing that exact same suit. I mean, it was just, it was ridiculous. You know, look, you can look back from a very successful point now, Oswald. You know, you're in a great position, worldwide fame, great clients and everything else. But, uh, you know, I, I know it was tough for you at one point. You know, you got the banks turned you down. You had, uh, you know, you actually went bankrupt soon after you'd set up the business. You were only young at the time. Uh, your you know, collection was stolen from your shop just a year later. That's and, right. then, and then you even ended up divorcing you know, from your first wife. That's so a lot right. of pressure at once. So when you look back on it, I think, what, I wonder, what did you take out of all that struggle? What kept you motivated when you were going through all those times? Because it was all in a short period of time. No, it all happened at the same time, actually. Um, the, the, the big point is, is I, it's funny, I'm very spiritual. I've always been, but you get very spiritual when times are really bad. It's always the, it's the classic scenario. And uh, when that happened, um, I had this internal belief, like you know, if you want to call it a voice, it's telling me that I'll get through it. When it's all happening, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to rationalize when it's back to back, you know. You, you, you know your company goes in the receivership. Uh, you, you know, you're going through a divorce. And that's when you think you've worked those two things out, then you get your collection, and just before you can sell it, it gets stolen. You think, you look to the heavens and you go, okay, God. <laughs> what okay, wrong, what, yeah. what, you know, I mean, what do you want from me now? And, and it was that. It was quite literally, I kind of looked up to the heavens and I had to laugh. And I laughed, actually, to a point where I said, well, it can't get any worse than this. So all I can do is just do what I do, which is create. And actually, it was my creativity and my belief in my spirituality are the two things that actually navigated it through for me. And which it's a rule of life that I stick to and stick by because it's a very important rule. Now, Oswald, don't go away. We're going to take a very short break here. We're back with more one-on-one -on -one with Oswald Boateng in just a moment.